The Castle in the Attic, Chapter 4 Mrs. Phillips liked to sleep late in the mornings and brew her tea using the electric kettle in her bedroom. So William always ate breakfast with his parents. What are you doing in science now, William? His father asked. We just started using microscopes. It's boring because Mrs. Phillips and I have been doing it for ages. Right now we're looking at frogs' eggs. What about history? Said his mother as she stirred her coffee. Still on the Spanish settlers? Nope. The Southwest Indians. I have to write a paper on how to build an adobe house. Maybe your father could help you. He spent some time in Arizona. I was only 15 at the time, Anne, his father said. And those were the days when I wanted to be a movie star. So I didn't pay much attention to the local architecture. He winked at William. William pushed a soggy cereal around in the bowl. He had to get the spotlight off himself so he could scrounge some food for the silver night. How's your work, Dad? Jim Harrison and I walked over the site for the new house yesterday. It should be an exciting project because of the topography of the land. Really? his mother asked. I would have thought the land behind the school was very flat. While they talked about the Harrison's house, William slid a piece of toast and a slice of bacon into his napkin and tucked them up his shirt sleeve. May I be excused, he asked. I promised Jason I'd meet him early to go over some homework. William's face grew red the way it always did when he tried to lie. But his parents were too busy talking to notice. Anyway, Jason usually got to school early, so William had only told a half a lie. Certainly, dear, his mother said with a vague smile. Be careful riding home on your bike this afternoon. She said the same thing every day. See you tonight, said William as he headed up the stairs. Sir Simon, William called softly. I've brought you breakfast. There was no answer. He waited for a minute, half expecting to hear the clank of the small man's metal shoes on the stone staircase. I'll leave it for you in the kitchen. See you later. William crumbled up the bacon and half the toast and piled it on the kitchen table. Maybe I did dream the whole thing, he muttered to himself as he wheeled his bike out of the garage. Jason was waiting for him in the front hall. He and Jason had been best friends ever since first grade. William was the shortest kid in the class, and Jason wore thick glasses, so they were usually the brunt of everybody's jokes. Hanging out together had helped them develop tough skin and deaf ears. They walked up to the classroom. As usual, they had it to themselves for a few minutes. Nobody else in their class ever got to school early. You're late today. My parents were asking me the usual questions. How's school? How's science? How's history? How's life? You're lucky, Jason said. My parents never ask me anything. That's because your mother is home when you get there in the afternoon. She doesn't think she has to concentrate on you the way my mother does. Yes, she does. She just concentrates on the wrong things. Like, have I practiced the piano? And did I put out the garbage? That's why I spent half my life over at your house. Listen, did Mrs. Phillips change her mind about leaving yet? Jason asked. No, William said. But she brought the present she promised me. I forgot all about that. What was it? A castle, William said. A castle? William nodded. It's got four towers and a complete gatehouse and a chapel and a roof that lifts right off so you can see inside the bedrooms on the second floor. Can I come over this afternoon and see it? William didn't say anything for a moment. He hadn't decided yet whether or not to tell Jason about the silver night. The other kids were filing into the classroom. Find your seats, please, the teacher said as, she closed, as he closed the door behind him. Can I? Jason whispered. Not today, okay? I have to go to a special gymnastics practice, William lied. Maybe tomorrow. The day seemed to drag by. The Silver Knight stayed in the back of William's mind all afternoon, and the teacher had to remind him twice to pay attention. By the time he left school, he had convinced himself that his adventures the night before were just a dream. You're home early, Mrs. Phillips said. 
She was down on her knees by the flagstone walk in the front yard. What are you doing? William asked. Turning over the soil for the border annuals. If the weather stays this warm, I'll be able to get the plants in before I leave. She started to get up. I, I don't need a snack today, he said quickly. You can finish what you're doing. But I thought we had to practice the back handsprings. I was going to spot you today. I want to play with the castle for a while. I'll be down soon. All right, she said. She went back to her digging, and he stopped at the kitchen door to glance at her. The curve of her back, the way her white hair fell down across her cheek, her crisscross gardening shoes tucked neatly under her skirt. Everything about her made him feel safe and happy. He grabbed an apple from the bowl on the kitchen table and went up to the attic, turning over and discarding his various plans for making her change her mind about leaving. None of them seemed right. He knew he had to do something. He was so distracted by these thoughts that he almost tripped over the castle. Young man, hold up, hold up, cried the silver knight, who was standing on the wall walk, waving frantically at William's knee. Sorry, William said, dropping down beside him. I was thinking about something. I didn't see you. Sir Simon looked indignant at the thought that anybody could forget about him. In your world, sir, I may be small, but in my own, I am known as a man to be reckoned with. I'm sure of that, Sir Simon, William replied quickly. Working his penknife out of his front pocket, he chopped a slice of apple into tiny chunks and put them down on the battlements of the wall. It didn't seem proper to put a knight's food on the floor. I brought you something to eat, he said. I'll bring you more after dinner. Sir Simon ate quickly, spearing each piece of apple with his dagger. William lowered the drawbridge, and the knight joined him at the top of the attic stairs, glancing cautiously about him as he scrambled across the wide planks of the floor. William lifted himself carefully up onto a trunk that had been pushed against the wall. To defend yourself against any unseen enemy, you should always keep a wall at your back. Sir Simon remarked, as he settled into a comfortable sitting position. If you don't mind, sir, I want to know where you came from and how you got here, William said. I thought you would have some questions when you, when you returned, young man. I cannot answer them all. Can you tell me what you do know then? William asked. Certainly. I hope you are comfortable because this tale will take some will take some little while to tell. William nodded. Please start. Very well, then. I was the only son of my father, Lord Aquila, a noble and powerful knight, who was at the end of his life a very sick man. He contracted an unknown disease that caused his limbs to weaken and shake so bad, for days at a time, he would take to his bed. We called in respected doctors from all over the land, and even from across the ocean. They did no good, although they charged high fees. It cost us dearly to board their servants and stable their horses, while they took their time considering the matter of the disease and conferring with one another. At this point, the knight, clearly upset, got to his feet and began pacing back and forth. William was worried that he might fall off the edge of his lookout, but after a while, he grew calmer and sat down again. At that time, Sir Simon went on, there was a wizard in my father's kingdom by the name of Alastor. Some months before my father grew ill, this man had arrived at the castle one morning seeking employment, and my father had taken pity on him. He was a raggle-taggle sort when he first appeared. His robe was torn and dusty, and he talked about having traveled long distances and having suffered much. From the beginning, I was more suspicious of his story than my father, and pressed Alastor for details. He gave none. At first, Alastor seemed perfectly harmless. He was given a room down near the kitchen, where he sometimes invited me to help him mix up potions and salves that were supposed to straighten crooked bones and settle upset stomachs. He had a wardrobe in the room that he always kept locked, and I noticed he was careful never to open it when I was there. The more I saw of Alastor, 
the less I really knew him. He was a man of secrets, some of which he told me, but more often I heard tales of the wrongs that had been that had been done him. The stories were garbled, and I didn't pay much attention to the details. But I sensed, even then, his desperate need to control people, to have power. Let me give you an example. Around his neck, the wizard wore a length of woven ribbon from which dangled three medals or tokens. Once, early on in our acquaintance, when he still trusted me, he pulled that necklace out of his robe and showed and showed it to me. In the middle hung a small flat disc made out of lead. At the time, I did not find it particularly interesting. I know better now. Hanging from the ribbon on either side of the disc, there were two halves of one metal that showed the two faces of Janus. They had hinges, and Alistor told me that they could be fitted together when necessary, but he preferred to use them separately. The word January comes from Janus, doesn't it? William asked. Precisely, Sir Simon said. I see your education has not been entirely neglected. Janus guards the gates of heaven and looks both ways in time. But the image of Janus on Alistor's necklace had an evil, magical power. One half of the token made things small, and the other restored them to their normal side, size. The symbols besides, beside Janus's head on each surface were different. The side that made things small showed two staffs, the instruments of punishment. The other side showed two keys. I saw him work this magic on a rat. When he pointed the staff side, the, the rat shrank to the size of a toy. When he used the side of, with the keys, the rat returned to normal. I am convinced that most of Alastor's magic lay in that necklace. But I never learned much more about it, because after a while, he grew secretive around me. Meanwhile, my father got steadily worse. The doctors were totally mystified. I suppose I was the one who thought of asking Alistor for help, though now I curse myself for the idea. He came and sat by my father's bed, asking about the symptoms and making a long list in some strange language. The next day, the wizard began administering an evil-smelling potion to my father, who took it reluctantly, as the taste was as bad as the odor. To our amazement, he appeared to get better. The palsy seemed less violent, and my father had long periods of peace when he could rest. It was not until much later that I realized the drug that helped him sleep was also slowly poisoning him. Alistor was hailed as a genius by all of us, and my father insisted that the wizard be given a large bedroom right next to his own. To everybody's relief, the doctors were bundled off to wherever they had come from. My father became quieter with every passing day, and he slept a great deal. When he was awake, he insisted that Alistor stay near him, for he felt the wizard was responsible for his recovery. I often came in to find them deep in conversation, and my father began to grow suspicious of me and of his, of his own trusted counselors. Alistor was poisoning his mind and his body at the same time. William's legs were beginning to ache, so he shifted position. I'm taking too long to tell this story, Sir Simon said quickly. I will hurry. Just days before my father died, he issued various edicts through Alistor. In these, the counselors were sent on missions to neighboring kingdoms. They objected, knowing my father was near death. It meant that they would have to return to the kingdom through the forest. Alistor had put some sort of spell on the forest to protect our kingdom from attack, and we knew the counselors would not be able to get back through. We were convinced Alistor controlled my father's every action, but my father would not even see us to listen to our arguments. Alistor had moved his pallet into my father's room, and he even ate his meals there. The counselors had no choice but to leave, and after that, my only friend in the castle was my old nurse, Calendar, who had been with me since birth. She and I sat up late into the night discussing plans for defeating Alistor. 
but they came to nothing. My father died at last, and if there is anything I can thank Alastor for, is that he, is that he went peacefully and without pain. But I can never forgive Alastor for turning my father against me. At the end, he would not speak to me at all, saying that I had been a traitor to him and to our kingdom. Sir Simon stopped speaking and covered his face for a moment. Then he went on. The day after the funeral, Alastor came to my room and showed me a paper that my father had signed before he died. It proclaimed that Alastor was to succeed my father as I was not fit to rule. Calendar was with me at the time. I was dressed in a full suit of armor as I was about to review the guard. I ripped the paper to shreds, and the two of us attacked the wizard. Alastor pulled the necklace from under his robe, pointed the lead disc at me, and mumbled a word. I reached up and snatched at the necklace, which fell off his neck. One half of the Janus medal came away in my hand. He lunged at me and tried to get it back, but I curled my fingers around it and held on. Calendar was trying to pull him off me, but I could not help her because by that time, Alastor's spell had begun to work. The bottom half of me had already turned to lead. I could not move my head, my feet or bend my knees. The knight shuddered, remembering that moment. It was horrible. I cried out to Calendar, but she was no longer, uh, no longer struggling with the wizard. They were both watching me. He with a terrible smile on his face. And Calendar. The knight stopped speaking for a moment as if he were trying to work out something in his mind. I realize now that Calendar, des Calendar deserted me in the end. It was too late to save me, and she must have known she would be left behind with the wizard. At the very last moment, as my face was growing smooth and cold, Alastor flipped the lead disc and pointed the other side at me. Then everything went black. And the next thing I saw was you. So the other side of the lead disc made you small? William asked. No, it must have sent me here. I'm not small in my own country, young man, only in yours. The Silver Knight patted the pouch that hung from his belt. This is the weapon that makes things small. The token... I stole from Alastor. How do you know it still works? Why, I had not thought of that, said the Silver Knight, pulling apart the drawstrings of his pouch. I suppose we'd better test it out on something. William glanced around him. Here, try this, he said, placing an old pincushion on the ledge in front of the knight. Sir Simon extended both arms, and holding the token before him like a shield, he pointed it directly at the pincushion. Nothing happened. I remember Alastor muttered something when he used it on the rat, the knight said. Try the word small, William suggested. Small, said Sir Simon. The pincushion remained the same. They tried five or six other words, but still nothing happened. Perhaps it was only perhaps it only works on living things, Sir Simon said. He glanced up at William thoughtfully. Oh, no, you don't, William said, standing up. You can't try it on me because you couldn't make me big again. There'd be nobody to bring you food, and you'd be in terrible trouble when Mrs. Phillips came looking for me. It was only an idea, my dear sir. Do not alarm yourself, Sir Simon said. But how else will we know if it works? I know. I'll bring you a bug or something tomorrow. Suddenly, the attic door opened down below. William, Mrs. Phillips called. I've been calling you. It's dinner time. William reached down and scooped up Sir Simon so that the knight was safely hidden in his hand by the time Mrs. Phillips started up the stairs. I'm coming, he said quickly. Mrs. Phillips stopped at the tone in his voice and gazed up at him. Everything all right? she asked. Yes, just fine he said as casually as he could. I'll be there in a minute. He could feel Sir Simon squirming inside his hand, so he loosened his hold enough to give the little man some air. All right, then, she said as she headed back down. A 
as she headed back down the stairs. Don't forget, you've still got your homework to do, and we haven't practiced the back handsprings in two days. That was close, William said as he set Sir Simon on the wall walk. The knight was gasping for air, and some minutes went by before he was able to speak. My dear sir, more gently, if you please, I am no longer made of lead. Sorry, it had to be quick, William explained. Listen, if you ever hear the attic door open and I and I knock three times on the wall, that means you must hide quickly because somebody is with me. The knight nodded. See you later when I bring up your dinner. Until then, Sir Simon said weakly. I'll catch a bug tomorrow, William added as he went down the stairs. <laughs>